Well, this is really quite, quite an honor for me. I'm glad everybody was able to come today, and I'm happy to be able to tell you a little bit about what we've actually already started to do with uh, the funds from the uh, uh, Foundation Award and what we're planning to do in the future. Um, so this is a picture of potato that I took when I was in Peru. You can see it's a very exciting collection of colors and shapes, and I've worked on potatoes since 1999, and um, I'll tell you first about a project that we're going to be using um, for uh, this foundation for. Um, so um, first of all, I wouldn't have gotten this award if it wasn't for a collection of really talented people that have worked for me through the last 20 years, and this is a picture taken outside of the plant biology building of my group. Um, and we photoshopped in the undergraduates and interns that are uh, not always available for the group photo. Um, but really, they're, they're a very talented group of people. And um, uh, it's a credit to them that I was able to get this award because of their efforts. Okay, So I work on genomics. And um, the genome is essentially a representation of the blueprint of any cell, either if it's a bacteria, a virus, an uh, animal, or a plant. And essentially, you're, you're uh, genome is, is the uh, DNA. It's an alphabet of four different letters, and those are instructions for the cell how to grow, divide, replicate, reproduce, and deal with stress and adapt to stress. So in eukaryotes, like plants and us, the DNA is packaged into chromosomes. You've probably seen those kinds of pictures. Um, and all the DNA, you have other actual little mini genomes inside of you, and plants have two mini genomes, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. All of that are, are the instructions for the cell in order how to actually grow and divide. So for the genome, it's the blueprint, and it's giving them instructions how to do that. And variation in the genome sequence is what gives us different phenotypes. So we're all different because our genomes are all slightly different from each other. And you can have differences among the population. You can have differences among species. This is what makes a rat a rat and a human a human is that there's differences in the genome. And then there's also differences between, say, plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi. So for projects that I, I'm going to be using these funds for um, center around three different sort of approaches to ask biological questions. And the first I'll tell you about is how Andean farmers 10,000 years ago took a wild plant, a potato that was really small, the size of a golf ball, and over 10,000 years selected this big yummy tuber that we're growing here today. And so that process is called domestication, and it was started 10,000 years ago. We're just putting the finishing touches on their actual breeding um, to make cultivars today for potato chips and french fries. I'll also talk a little bit about some medicinal genomics work that I've been doing. I started working on medicinal plants in 2009 through an NIH initiative, and I'll tell you about things that we're continuing on with that project. And last, now that genomics, it's a technology that started 20 years ago by Craig Venter at the Institute for Genomic Research, and it went from being very challenging and expensive to do one genome to we could do anybody's genome now for $1,000 in two or three days. And so with genomics now, Biology is very much empowered, and I feel the 21st century will be known as an era of genome-enabled biology in all parts of biology. And so now we can take genomics and look at other crop plants besides the big three, say corn, wheat, or rice. Okay, so a little bit about potato. Um, the origins of potato is uh, in, in South America in the Andes Mountains, and it was domesticated from some wild potato species about 10,000 years ago. And then a small number of potatoes were actually brought to Europe in the late 16th century by the conquistadors, and you went from uh, a different latitude, and actually there was an actual selection event such that the potato would actually grow and produce tubers under the day length of the northern Europe. And so that's how the modern potato was actually born. Then, of course, when everyone immigrated to the United States, um, they brought the potato with them, and pretty much what we're eating are, are highly related to those that were selected for um, in Europe in the 1700s. So if we look at wild species um, and we compare them to modern species, you'll actually see that they're actually quite different from themselves. And um, the, the selection of modern potato that we're eating today is actually re very restricted in terms of the overall diversity. So if we look at current cultivars, here's three here, Yukon Gold, you could buy it right now in Meyer. It's going to be the yellow potato that you would get. And if we look at Atlantic and Superior, they're two major cultivars. Atlantic is used to make potato chips. You'll see they actually look pretty similar to each other. 
But if we go and look at wild potato species, these produce tubers as well. You can see the leaves look quite different from, them, from, each, from the cultivated potato. And if you look, you can see that the tubers, this is what we're eating, is actually quite small. So clearly there was selection for these giant tubers. There was selection for taste and selection for um, nutrition. And so what we're working on now is trying to find the genetic differences between those wild and cultivated potatoes. What were those farmers selecting for when they just kept picking the best potato out of the field? And um, we're doing that by doing a genome survey for um, what we would call domestication genes. What were key things that were selected for? And this is work that my graduate student, Michael Hardin, again, is working on. Um, so the other topic that I'm, I'm going to use the funds for is to work on medicinal plant, plants. And so plant, plants have a large number of natural products, and they've been used to, in, for pharmaceuticals, they're used for cosmetics, they're used for food additives. Um, uh, herbal remedies, you'd be surprised how many uh, uh, plant natural products are being used for health promotion um, activities. And they're typically being used because they produce specific secondary metabolites or specific molecules that have a benefit. And for a lot of these, we actually under, don't understand very much about how those chemis chemistries are, occur in the plant, how to actually make the plant produce more so we could harvest them for that. Um, and if we could look at the genome sequence of these species, we could potentially figure out how these metabolites are made and actually make more of them. And so what we'd like to do is to be able to figure out the genes, the blueprint to make these um, chem chemicals, and then move them into a heterologous system like yeast, yeast so we can make a lot more of it. This would also allow us to make other analogs of those. So for example, if a plant's making a pharmaceutical drug or an anti-cancer drug, maybe we can make it more potent if we can actually change the chemistry. And also what we can do is we can take that information and now make new to nature metabolites. We can make things that nature really hasn't gotten around to making yet, okay? So the first medicinal plant that I started working on in detail was Catharanthus roseus. It's um, Madagascar periwinkle, and you may have this um, in your yard. And it produces these uh, compounds, vinblastine and vincristine. They're used for anti-cancer. Heavily used, it's a, a billion dollar industry right now to make this drug, it's still extracted from the plant. And um, what we did was we collaborated with Sarah O'Connor, who's been working on catharanthus for a long time. We sequenced the genome, we did a set of analyses, this data actually has just been published this last month. We resolved the gene networks responsible for producing these two compounds. We actually were able to go in and mine the genome and find new genes that were involved in the pathway. And because of this work, Sarah now has almost a nearly complete pathway for production of vinblastine and vincristine. And in another project, we've been working with Dean Delapena. This is another offshoot from our NIH project, is production of Camptothecin from Camptotheca acuminata. And again, this is an anti-cancer drug. It's, it's worth three quarters of a billion dollars. It's actually very toxic itself, so it actually it's made it into a derivative for uh, uh, cancer treatment. And we've already got the genome sequence from this tree now, and the question is, is can we actually compare it to a related plant that actually doesn't produce camptothecin, and then look for pluses and minuses between the two genomes to better target what genes are responsible for camptothecin biosynthesis. So with the help of Frank Tulewski here on campus, he told me that we have two relatives of camptotheca. Camptotheca is a subtropical tree. It can only grow in a greenhouse. But he told me about this dove tree that's outside the, the new plant sciences building and Tupelo, which is just out my back door. And we went and looked at them with Dan Jones and um, the Tupelo doesn't produce camptothecin and the dove tree produces a little bit. And so right now my postdoc, Dong Yang Zhao, is working on getting the genome sequence from Tupelo. So we can literally just do a plus minus comparison between these two species and get a better candidate list of genes responsible for amphithecin biosynthesis. So the next project I'm going to tell you about is a project on the mints. And the mints produce all kinds of really neat chemicals that we all actually probably are going to eat today. We'll eat some of them today. You may not know it. You may have used them this morning in, in, when you were in the shower. And uh, a lot of plants are in the plant, mint family. Obviously the mint, we all know about spearmint and peppermint. This is actually worth $200 million a year as an agronomic um, crop in the United States. And if you think about mint in everything from toothpaste to gum to any other flavorings, um, you can see that harvesting mint oil is actually a pretty important agro agronomic crop. But we also have basil, rosemary is also in it, 
And my favorite is catnip. I can just see we're going to get a publication and we're going to be on the cover of Cat Fancy. I'm like pretty excited. <laughs> pretty excited about that one. And it's surprising, but it turns out teak is in the mint family as well. Um, and then the other favorite of mine is the chia pet. And so um, this is actually now considered a superfood. Us older people all remember having a chia pet, but this is now a superfood because it's supposed to be healthy. Um, but I can see we can publish work in the onion on the chia pet. Um, <laughs> but we're um, uh, actually waiting to get finalization of an NSF grant that we're going to work on on the Mint family. But what I'd like to do with the foundation funds is that from that data we're going to collect from the NSF project, we're going to understand a lot about synthesis of these diverse chemicals in this family. And can we actually use them to make new chemicals, new to nature chemicals that we haven't seen before. And so that's what I'd like to do with um, that project. And the last project is on blueberries, which if you didn't know, Michigan's the number one blueberry state. Um, um, they're also considered a superfood, whatever that meme is. Um, it has a lot of antioxidants, um, but they also have been reported to have these compounds called iridoids, which are known to be um, beneficial um, uh, chemicals. And we're going to work on this project to decipher the iridoid biosynthetic pathway. And this is going to support an NIH postdoctoral fellowship that Courtney Leisner in my lab got um, recently from NIH. And so we'll be looking at um, secondary metabolites in blueberries.